Mark, thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. No problem at all, Brendan. How, How are, you? are you? I'm good. I'm very good. And I was I was looking through um, and preparing for this conversation last night and looking through your career and all the things you do. And I kind of thought, where do I start with you? You do so many, so many different things. And so just to maybe briefly introduce, I mean, you're, you're a chartered accountant. Um, you're a co-founder of a financial services recruitment uh, firm. So you're an entrepreneur. You're an artist, which I'm intrigued by because you're incredibly tar- talented. And I've seen some of your work, particularly over the last six months. Um, and I see you've recently been commissioned by Richard Branson himself. I know Barack Obama has in the past and a whole host of other people. Um, and we definitely need to get into that. You're a part-time podcast host as well, um, similar to myself. And, and you were one of the first people to offer your support to me when I kicked this one off. Uh, and thanks for that. And you're also an author. So look, there's a load to get stuck into. Um, and obviously yeah, the aim start. of this podcast is to give people a sense of you know a career and, and maybe if they're going down a similar path that we can maybe give them some advice um explain to them what what you know the benefits of a certain career are what you love about them maybe some of the challenges as well so maybe the, the best thing mark is to to go right back do you want to just give a introduce yourself you know where you're from and and maybe we can go back to where you grew up school that kind of thing yeah i think and and thanks for the kind words um i i, I think it's probably best explained chronologically how my kind of career evolved. So if you go back right to the start, uh, from Shankill in South South Dublin, um, what went to Cabin Teeley Community School, um, nice school, local school around here. I'm still around this area, um, and I didn't, I never, I, t- I tell you what I wanted to be. I wanted to play for Celtic. That's what I wanted to do when I was a was young a young yeah. lad. Um, obsessed with football, that was it. That like I was decent in school, like I was, you know, I was able to get good marks and good grades. But I had no, I didn't think at all what I wanted to do. But I was really good at at art. So everybody was kind of telling me, you know, you're going to be an artist. You're going to be an artist. Like, but nobody actually thought like, let's actually think of that. Like, what can, what does a job of an artist actually entail? Hmm. You know, it's. Is it you're it, people see like it's almost you're either a starving artist or you're Picasso, like there's there is very little middle ground in there. I know very li- very little, and I I went on and and developed my art career and stuff like that. But I know very little full time artists. Mm. So there is careers that you can do with art and I, I, like animation, graphic design, and uh, that kind of thing. But I never, I actually, I regret not actually focusing on on that a little bit more. How I could actually get a job out of my passion, right? So I had yeah. two passions, football and art, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and how that young was it. were you, so, Mark, when, when you knew you loved art? Like, at what age did, did you know that that was a passion of yours already? Yeah, people always ask me that question. They say, like, is it in the family? Where did it come from? I, I was thinking about it recently because I get asked the question a, a lot. Um, when I was five, so I would have been junior infants in school, there was an art competition uh, for the whole of Ireland, for, like for five year olds, to we all had to draw a snowman, right? So I just was told by a teacher draw a snowman. I remember it and I drew it. And it was in chalk and it was on this black paper and it was rubbish. Like like looking at it now, I can't see anything in it. You know, yeah. it was it was what you think a five year old would draw. Uh, no offense to the five year olds out there, um, but I won, right? I won this competition and it was to have and the the. the the piece of art was exhibited in the National Gallery of Ireland and we went out there and I remember going out there with my parents and with my grandmother and just feeling like oh, this is uh, like this I'm special here like you know yeah. not even now just kind of like oh why am I here why am I here why is everybody talking about me why is that framed in this big place it's because I'm great you know it's because I'm the artist now so I and then it was when it when it was taken from the, the gallery it was put in my school on the wall beside the principal's office for like the, the rest of the six years or whatever i was i was there uh i was known as the artist of the school so i feel i think i actually had to become that i worked extra hard to continue that because of the feeling that i got um being told i was this great artist when it really at the time i really wasn't but uh maybe that's what kind of spurred me on and i, I know i do have a so I do realism stuff so I definitely kind of have some sort of photographic memory in that way that I can replicate like my brother calls me a a human photocopier 
really? You're yeah. like, that's, that's what I can do. But I'm actually not that creative, to be honest. Like, I'm not, I'm not the guy who, you know, gets, gets the paints out and just splashing them around and moving them around. And, you know, it's very, very methodical. It's, it's planned out. You get the proportions, like, it's, like, down to a millimeter with, with a face. Really? You have to have the proportions mapped out properly before. So it's a complete map on a, on a, on a canvas. And then it's almost paint by numbers. Once you know really? how to paint, so that's how I I work, and I'll add a few extra things at the end. But I'm not; I wouldn't be like a typical artist. So, yeah. And when, when you people say realism, think I'm creative, when you say realism, yeah, Mark, realism. What, 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 for the non-artists among us, what, what what is that exactly? That is, it can be any. It can be figurative. It could be, you know, it could be objects. You know, still life type of stuff. But yeah. it's probably trying to achieve hyper realism is basically like making it look like a photograph. Right. Yeah. That's that's. Yeah. If I I'll actually, I have one here. It's probably if people are listening to this. It's probably no use. But I'm gonna hold it up to the camera. So this is one I've just done recently. Oh wow, uh, that's incredible. No, that's a little bit. I went a little bit arty on that one, yeah. um, just for something different. But uh, so that's the kind of thing. It's amazing, and I saw the um, one you did of of Richard Branson uh, as well. So is all that like you said? You know, it's it's methodical by numbers, but are you doing all that mm -hmm. like freehand? It's all paint. It's yeah. So yeah. it's oil paint. Like I do it with a like a pen or a pencil first yeah. on the canvas, and then you use a grid system and you f for portrait painting. Like if I'm not doing a portrait, I don't have to be as pre precise. But it's yeah. all to do with the symmetry of the face. If you do someone's face slightly lower, like it can really, or one eye slightly lower, the painting's ruined. It doesn't look like the person. There's something in the human mind that can sense like a millimeter, two millimeters off. And we're just yeah. like, that's that's wrong, you know? Yeah. So I could be a bit more freehand with like the backgrounds and even even the f folds of, um, you know, clothes and stuff like that. But with yeah. the face, you have to get it spot on. So... Uh, and can yeah, people see those online? Like, is there somewhere people can go to see your work online, Mark? Or yeah, well, you can see it in real life if you want. Um, it's in in the I'm in the Green Gallery in Stevens Green Shopping Centre in in Dublin. Um, so the top floor there, it's a great gallery. Most people actually know it because to get to the toilets, you actually have to walk by That's the gallery. Right. I know the gallery. well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, yeah. So yeah, the footfall is actually really really high there. Uh, so you'll probably see a good few of mine in there at the moment. Um, all my usually my most recent stuff um so i've been exhibiting there since i'm probably 37 now so probably probably 21 maybe is when i 20 was when i got into my first gallery yeah. that's a big achievement um once you're in there you're kind of legit you know um yeah. so how do you get in there? yeah and then so online if, if I, I, mm -hmm. oh, sorry mark so how, how do you get in you said there it's an achievement you know to get into your own gallery mm -hmm. at, at 20 like, how does that work? So if, if there's people listening that are fancy themselves now as artists, as teenagers, what, what, mm. what, what do you need to do to get yourself into a gallery? What's the challenge there? Yeah, it's a bit, there's a bit of a, a snobbery about it, you know. It's like if you're in a gallery, do, do you know in, in Merrion Square, there's, you, can, you can exhibit your art on the railings all around you yeah. ever see the artists on yeah. a Saturday and Sunday? That's a great place to buy art and support artists. But if you're, a lot of galleries won't let you in actually if into their into their gallery if you're on the railings. Um, oh, so right. it's it's quite tough to get into a gallery. I, if I was given someone advice now, I would actually say you don't need to be in a gallery anymore. Hmm. You have you'll have your website. You have so I've my website, I've Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. That's all you need. And then you develop a following, you know, if you have a thousand, what do they call it? A thousand true fans, you know, you, you've got a, a bit of a business going there, you know? Yeah. Um, so you have more control now than you did back, say, you know, 15 years ago when it was, you're at the mercy of galleries, whether you could make it or not. Um, and the galleries take 50 up to 50%. So, uh, it's yeah, a big chunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, no, but it's, it's a, look, I think even though you don't need them anymore, it's still a big thing for people to, to get in that maybe for the credibility. It does add credibility. Um, you probably will. A mix of both is actually ideal, but it's, they'll only look at your stuff once generally. So you got, you got to have your best stuff ready and then you present it to them because you keep coming back that they might just keep saying no. So I approached mm -hmm. the gallery, the Apollo gallery, the owner there said to me, 
it's gone now. He's actually passed away, but he he gave me some really good advice. He said, "Look, you're, I emailed my my stuff over you know, photographs, and I said, look, I'm looking to get into the gallery, blah blah blah." And he said, "We're full at the moment, but my piece of advice would be to you: one, your your stuff is very good. It's 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 very realistic. I mean, it looks like what it is, but like there's a lot of people that do portraits. So, what is your unique mode of expression that's going to separate you from just the average?" portrait painter because mm. there's so many great portrait painters you know um so that's when i came up with the the in tree like a trip tech they call it as well so basically like a face in the middle it's almost like a face split and then the one in the middle i don't know if you've seen it but that's my kind of i have that's my kind of thing now um so w once i did that people could have kind of oh that's a mark baker now that they recognize it so that was a really Superb. good bit of advice so to be be different um yeah that's yeah. how you get in and how, how long does it take? I, I was looking, I, I've been looking at that Richard Branson one uh, all yesterday evening. I think it's, it's, it's really impressive. But how long does something like that take you or the Johnny Sexton one there? How long does it take for you to get that done? It takes, it takes me a lot quicker now than, than I used to. Um, just, just from doing it over and over again, I suppose. But um, that was, I was under pressure time-wise for the Richard Branson one. So that had to be over in Necker Island within a week. And obviously, I run a, a business, Darwin Hawkins, a finance recruitment business. That's my day job. That's that's ninety nine point nine percent of what I do. Yeah. So, I would when I paint, I probably start at about nine p.m. Um, and then maybe to midnight sometimes. So that'd be my kind of you know two or three hours in the evening. Yeah, I could get a I could get a one good painting a week done that way. If, you, if that makes Brilliant. sense. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah, that's because it's hard to say because I'm not doing a full time. If I was doing a full time, I could I could do a lot a lot more. But it's tough to make it as an artist, and I gave up that yeah. dream a long time ago. Yeah, well, you haven't, you haven't. Like it, it's incredible because, as I said earlier, the amount of stuff that you do do to that it just shows the passion you have that you've kept this going all that time and you've never let it go. I think that's incredibly impressive because yeah. a lot of people you know, the passion kind of drops sometimes, um, whereas you haven't let that happen. Yeah. And you're still doing it, you but know? Key, and that's the key word, though, Brendan. It's it's passion. I'm very passionate about what I do. And, like, some people could be passionate about gardening, about music, about podcasting, about, you know, what I write, writing. Yeah. If, if you're passionate about it, time almost doesn't exist in that way. Like, people say, geez, you're working all day. You're up since 6 a.m. and you're starting your, your job, your other job then at 9 p.m. but it's not like that i read somewhere once that to what you saying that if you, if you want to relax um you shouldn't do nothing you know so you do the you should do the opposite to what you're doing all day yeah so when i was an accountant like that i could really feel the benefit of actually instead of just sitting around watching netflix or whatever i I'd, after a long day I, i'd paint and it, it would almost counterbalance you back and and you get into like a flow state and I, I, I really recommend that anybody finds uh, their their kind of flow state vehicle, like uh, their their whatever their passion is, and yeah, and don't let it go because there is enough hours in the day to to do it if you're passionate about it. Yeah, no, it's great advice, and and even exercise. I mean, we've talked with others on the podcast hmm. as well. It could be exercise. Even for me, we spoke before recording. This podcast is is a bit of that for me. You know, the aim was to try to give something back to younger people that are coming up, get some advice out there for, for them. Um, but also for myself to do something completely different, you know, and something that I, I yeah. thought I'd enjoy doing as well, which is, which is great. But, um, so you, you knew at five years old, right. That you had this ta Well, maybe you didn't, as you said, you mightn't have known you had this talent, but it was fantastic to get that affirmation, I suppose, from people mm. in the competition. So y you went on, let, let's say you kept that going, the art side, what did you end up as you went through secondary school? Was your focus shifting towards other career options, and what were you thinking as you approached college and things like that? Yeah, yeah, and this is the whole career thing is is something that's very important to me, and it's actually I've been thinking about it probably throughout my whole career. The main issue at the very start was that I didn't have a great career guidance counselor in my school, mm. you know. And I was hoping that that's not the case anymore, but 
I do I do a podcast as well, um, and it's all about business and entrepreneurship and stuff. But everyone we speak to, we kind of ask them that question: What was your career guidance like when you were yeah. in your school? Like, did anyone give you a proper guide um, as a seventeen-year-old, whatever? And not, and and some of them are quite young entrepreneurs, you know, early twenties, and they're like, no, 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 didn't really have anyone to guide us. And it's so important, and it's shocking that the focus isn't there still. And anyway, so I didn't know, but I, I knew I had some brains and I had some ability to draw. So I thought architecture, easy, obvious, you know. Um, and then I done my portfolio, met the guys in UCD um, and they for, they called me for the second interview, but it went, and it was the house phone at the time. They left a message and I never got the message on the house phone. Um, oh dear. And I missed the second interview and I didn't get architecture. Um, I was actually waiting. I was waiting after. I was waiting after doing my leaving cert, and the results were out. I was waiting for that call, and I was like, and then I checked the results and what I got, and, and when it came out, and I was like, "You got arts." It was my second choice, yeah. and I was like, "I thought I literally thought I was going to get architecture." And anyway, I didn't get that, and I didn't want to wait another year in case I didn't get it again because it wasn't even a guarantee. Um, so my second choice was arts, and it was just a safety net second choice. Um, yeah. UCD arts degree i i randomly chose greek greek and roman civilization and history as my <laughs> subjects so um after three years there i was really gonna set the world on fire with, with those with that skill set um yeah. well, did you enjoy but again that, there was no one there hmm? did you enjoy th that course though i mean it was interesting i'm sure the subject matter yeah at least. yeah it was interesting but i'm a very practical person as well like and i was i was sitting there going Oh, these are wasted hours. I mean, it's, this is like a pastime. I felt like this, yeah. I'm here, but it. But my brother just kept saying to me, he had done it as well. Look, it's a base degree. You can go on and do whatever you want after it. You know. So yeah. I did a post grad. I ended up doing a post grad in accounting after. But yeah. underpinning everything as well with the art was the love of entrepreneurship. I always, I was always selling something. You know, and mm. I was, I suppose I got a taste for it with the art. I was selling my art to my friends first. You know, in school, um, things like that. So that's where the kind of business side came in. Mm. But during college, that's when I got into the galleries. So that's when it went from just selling to friends to like, I sold my first painting for like a thousand euro when I was like 20 or something in a gallery. And I was like, this is, I was like, this is great. Oh my God. I didn't realize this is, this actually could be a job. And then the next one sold and the next one sold. And I was working at Marks and Spencer's, um, stacking shelves. And I was like, lads, I hate, I hated it there. Hated that job. Yeah. Um, I said, look, I'm packing this in. I don't, don't need you anymore. Um, so I was a Tesco, I was a Tesco then, man. I, I know your pain. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not yeah, there's wrong with Tesco or Marks and Spencer's. They're, they're great stores. But, oh, yeah. great products. <laughs> great products. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I used to get the free, uh, I used to get free cookies at the end of the day as well. Oh, they yeah. try out a lot of stuff. So, uh, there was a little, <laughs> a few benefits. Um, so, so then I, I said, right, I'll, three years of college were done. Didn't know what I wanted to do after. So I said, I'll, I'll give this art a go for a year. So honestly, it was so busy and I, I was doing so well. I couldn't even paint fast enough. The, the stuff were, the, the paintings were selling before they were even finished because it was 2007, which was just before the crash, before mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Or whatever it was, 2006, 2007, and then the crash hit. And then nobody wanted to spend, you know, 3000 euro on a painting anymore. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't built up a sustainable business when I, when it came to that, it was like, you, 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 you paint a picture, it sells, it's gone forever. All your hard work is gone. Whereas what you probably should do, what I probably should have done at the time was uh, like sell prints, uh, limited edition prints. And I do that now of the painting and kind of make the prints work for you passively. You know, they they sell and all you have to do is sign off on them, you know? Yeah. Um. So it's a tough career. I don't know how people do it who are a full-time artist just painting and then, you know, on to the next one. So not knowing where the next paycheck was coming from, I was like, oh God, I don't want to ever be like that, you know? Um, so that's when I did, I actually, you know what, I tossed a coin between becoming a solicitor or an accountant because I thought, again, with no advice, I was like, they're the two most solid careers you yeah. can have, you know? And I think it landed on solicitor and then I saw the books and I was like, 
not a chance I'm reading all those books. I just, <laughs> I'm just after reading books for, for three years. Um, so, I yeah, I said, right, I, I like business. Um, I'll become an accountant. I'll get that skill set, you know. Um, I definitely don't regret it. It was, it was definitely the right thing to do. I did a postgraduate diploma in DCU, which was like a degree in one year. Um, so hard. Like, I found that so difficult because um, I'd never done accounting before. So with... With probably a week of that under my belt in the milk round was 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 on then. So the milk round was obviously when the accounting firms look to interview people looking to join the following year. Yeah. So I had basically a week of accounting knowledge in college, and I went and I applied to them all, did did the rounds, um, and got offered in Deloitte. Yeah. Uh, and I accepted it, but then with the view to I'd have to pass those exams, you know, to to get in the next year, and I did. I became a chartered accountant um i found that very hard uh obviously you did the exams yourself did you i did yeah 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 they're tough i found them they're tough exams like yeah but i i slipped a disc in my back lifting weights and i was like on my back studying um for these exams you know and oh, that was very very tough so probably my biggest achievement in my whole career is actually passing those exams um, yeah, I, I thought they were that difficult to be yeah. honest um, and Mark probably I think I had an exhibit you know I had an exhibition in London uh, a two week solo exhibition in London before the exams as well which I probably shouldn't have <laughs> 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 just an, an extra added pressure in there yeah. um, I think my firstborn was due as well uh, that year um, oh well perfect storm yeah yeah, I, I was like, I really need to get these exams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, fair, uh, well, fair yeah. play to you for pulling all that together. But I want to go back just before we move move on yeah. to something you said there about the career guidance, because you and I are, well, I'm mm. a bit older. I'm 40 years old, but we're, we're probably the 80s uh, generation anyway, the two of us and 90s for secondary school. And it was the same for me. Like we had there was a career guidance counselor in the school. But in the six years that I was there, there was never one conversation on career guidance. If there was a class for career guidance, it was go do your homework. That was it. There was never, mm. never anything given. And all, all my, my generation would say the same, like you've said. Um, and similarly to you, when I got to the leaving, um, I, I think I ended up taking, I didn't get my first or second choice at the time. I, I think I had medicine mm. down as, as first choice. And exactly like you, I thought, there's no way I'm doing it again. Because when I was at that age, I thought a year was a massive amount of time to put in the bin, as I thought back then. Mm. And I, I'd shake myself now if I could meet myself and go one year to maybe get something that you're, you're truly passionate about. Would you have had that sense as well, looking back even just now to, to young people? Would you give that advice? Like, don't, don't think one, even two or three years is nothing. Yeah, yeah. I think... I would, to be honest, I would even skip, you know, transition year. I did transition year. If I was to go back, I'd actually skip that. I'd finish earlier. Yeah. I'd and then I'd try a few things, and if I wasn't ha happy, I would just stop. And it's annoying that you have to wait to the next year to do something. Um, but I'd stop and I'd, I'd, because if you're in the wrong lane, like your 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 life can you can be a really great person, really smart, excellent at what you do, but if you're in the wrong lane. That it could be the worst thing ever. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, so once you find the lane that you're supposed to be in, you might think, "Oh, I'm a terrible worker. I'm a terrible this," but you're just in the wrong lane. There's such a difference between me as an accountant and then me as a recruitment uh, consultant. You know, doing what I'm doing now. Yeah, I'm I'm so much better at that. And I had ident and I had identified that I was never going to be. I'm a very comp competitive person, and and I like to do things to my best ability. And I just found like. I'm a, I'm average, maybe below average accountant here. And yeah. that's when I was like, I can't live my life like that. I'm going to have to find something else. Um, so it's so important to find what your lane is. And it's very hard to know as as yeah. a 17 year old. It's so hard to know without trying, without testing. Uh, but you're not really given that chance. Fair enough, there is a lot more. Kind of, You can look on YouTube, you can talk to people. It's it's a, the, the world is more connected now. And so kids should, should take advantage of that. But there's lots of things that, like you don't always have to go to college either. You know, you can absolutely. There's different ways. There's different ways of doing things. Um, yeah. But some people think it is you have to do your, you know, three year degree, and that's that's the only thing. Uh, yeah. But yeah, one year, 
is not as long as it's certainly a year flies in now at this age but yeah. back then a year does seem like and then you seem like you're behind everybody else and they're all you know at it's the that next comparison level comparison element yeah absolutely absolutely and yeah yeah so it's interesting because you, you and we'll talk maybe a little bit now about how you set up the the recruitment business but i have a couple of, of mm. friends who've done a very similar thing they, they were in big four and they went into recruiting and similar just have started your own business how did that materialize i mean your experience in deloitte can you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe how that drove you into thinking about setting up your own business as well yeah yeah so i obviously i did you do your three years or three and a half years in, in an accountancy practice which i did at the end of it i got a a, a secondment um i was chatting to a partner and he just said look would you be interested in doing a comment in a bank? It's a little bit different. Relationship management, dealing with borrowers, kind of helping them restructure loans and stuff like that. And I was thinking, anything but but doing what I'm doing, you know, uh, would be great, you know, to finish it out doing that. So I did that and I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the people side of it. But I was still getting to understand how businesses worked. I was getting to use my accountancy stuff. So when I finished there, it's a place called Certus. It's gone now, but it was... Uh, when bank when Lloyd's pulled Bank of Our, uh, Bank of Scotland out of their Irish market, they set up a company called Certus, which is basically to manage the loan book and um, to get in as much money, sell off properties and stuff as much as they could. And um, they kind of done their job after three years, and so it was kind of you're the architect of your own demise. And the harder you worked, the less work there's going to be left for you. So at the end of it, everybody was made redundant. So I done three years there. So that that three year. Like I never think I never look back and say, "Oh, that was a I regret that I regret that I actually don't regret anything, but if I could cut out any part of my career, it probably would be that period of three years um when i I didn't really learn as much uh I didn't really learn much after you know the first year yeah um but I did learn a good bit uh, the how banks work and you know that kind of stuff um and then i so I said right i better I better look for a a job right um so I met a recruiter. I actually met a, spoke to a few recruitment companies and didn't have a great experience with them. I felt like I, I couldn't trust them. They were only out just to make money off me. Um, they didn't really know what I did. You know, I went to one after Deloitte before I chose Certus. Um, he, I said, look, I'm looking to get into corporate banking. I worked in this, done this comment in, in a, a banking environment. And I actually had an offer from AIB in corporate banking at the time. Uh, and the guy told me, I won't say who he was now, uh, he just said, look, oh, you'll never get that. And he, but he didn't know I already had the offer there. And he said, you know, you have to do internal audit. That's, that's all you can do. And I was like, really? Uh, well, I don't think so. You've already <laughs> lost me now because I have, you know what I mean? Like, so I will never tell people that they can't do anything. I would, I would yeah. just say the likelihood of getting stuff, you know? So yeah. I had a few bad experiences. So then I was reluctant to actually start meeting recruiters again but i asked a mate um, and he said he recommended uh, a guy called nilo kelly um in fk international at the time so Niall actually trained the pwc himself he understood my background very very similar backgrounds actually um met him had a good chat real honest chat and he just goes you're not an accountant are you and i was like uh, no, I can. Yeah, I can do it. Like, ah, you're not really, you know, are you? And I was like, well, no, no. <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you want to do? I said, to be honest, and I said, I, just, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do, you know. And he said, do you ever think of doing something like this? And I said, well, kind of, because I knew someone who'd gone into recruitment already, and I, my landlord owned a recruitment company, and I'm, I'm the accountant, and I'm paying this landlord, and he's he's the recruiter, and I said, something wrong there now. Um, <laughs> And then I said, look, have a think about it uh, and come back to me. I'll have a chat on it. And one thing led to another. I said, right, I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll take a risk on this. Like I think the, I, I was combining a lot of my uh, skill sets, you know, the finance knowledge. It was important because it was mm -hmm. finance recruitment. I liked the people side of things, getting to meet people all the time, variety, um, it wasn't a technical role, not a technical person, so uh, definitely that wasn't there. Um, and the kind of creativity, the marketing, you know, advertising, that is a big part of it. I could kind of have an avenue for my kind of arty kind of side there as well. Um, and there was the potential longer term, well, it turned out to be medium term, to actually own my own business, to do it myself. You know, I just, I was never going to be my own, have my own accountancy practice. 
yeah. I could have, but I wouldn't have enjoyed it. You know, again, wrong lane. You know, even though it would have been entrepreneur, it would have been half the battle. The entrepreneur side would have been ticked, but the other half would have been accountancy, which I'm not good at. You know, um. So, at the time, I had two young kids, like like a, like a three year old and a one year old or whatever the, the girls were at the time. So it was a big enough risk to to move into something different. Um. But I did it, and I didn't regret it. it turned out I was quite good at it. Um. Then three years later. Um, myself and Niall uh, decided to to do our own thing, and that's how Darwin Hawkins was was formed. So Niall actually hired me, and then we ended up going into business together. Fantastic, fantastic! And, yeah. and you touched on all you know. I think what what you like about it, and and what it gives back to you, the people side, and and on all that kind of thing. Yeah. When you started out on your own, or or with Niall, and you're creating that company. I mean, what mm. are the what were the big challenges you guys faced as you moved from let's say FK where you're working and, and then you're out on your own, basically. Um, the challenges, um, well, I think just, just starting a business is a, any business is a challenge. It's like, when are you going to get paid? You know, what if it doesn't work? It's such a, it's such a risk to take, you know, that was the first thing. Just, just will it work? The challenge of, look, we had the credibility, we had the skill set, we had, you know, the knowledge of the market, the connections, but but what if they don't all merge together? Or what if it takes too long and then, you know, goes under, you know? So we we said, look, will we, and we had a very amicable split from from FK, you know, still still very good friends with FK, you know? Um, but um, I think funding is important. You, you got to make sure that, that, that the business is able to survive. So, you, look, you can bootstrap an account, a, a recruitment business, but... We didn't just want to be a two-man band, just kind of, we wanted to build a proper, good, we, the best finance recruitment company in Ireland. That's what we wanted to build. And anything less wasn't going to hmm. inspire us. So we we said, look, who's the, the biggest uh, person in, in recruitment and globally? And it was James Cann. Um, so James Cann, Dragon's Den, in the in BBC in the UK, one of the I think it was the first or second season he was on. So that's how he made his his fortune was recruitment. So yeah. we you know had a chat with, with him and he was interested in the Irish market, and we uh, we 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 went down the the funding route then through through him and 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 he his his vehicle that invests in recruitment companies they provide you know support when it comes to operations like finance, payroll, marketing all that kind of stuff that kind of frees us up to do what we do best, you know, which is getting out there, meeting people, do, you know, doing what we enjoy. So it kind of takes that away from us. So uh, that, was that, great was, uh, support. that was a clever way of doing it, actually, getting someone like that to, to help kind of underpin it. Yeah. And I, I certainly like there's, there's pros and cons to that, obviously, you know, yeah. we know that, but I, I certainly don't regret it. Regret it. Um, uh, what other challenges was there? Yeah, like you start out, you know, we had a nice, lovely, fancy office and we said, look, we go big from the start um, and you're expecting people to be knocking on your door. You know, the phones don't, but the phones don't ring. It's very quiet at the start when the phones don't ring. Yeah. And you're just like, we didn't tell everybody, we're, we, you know, we're doing our own thing now. <laughs> but we, you obviously, you can, when you leave a company, you can't do anything for for a few months. So that's fair and we stuck to that. But like then you, you switch the light on and you, you turn the computer on and you make your announcement and then you're just... You're rubbing your hands, right? It's gonna be busy now, and it doesn't, and it doesn't happen. And mm. you're kind of like, Jesus, this is taking a little bit longer than than we thought. Um, so, but it, I would say, so the key to that was just being resilient and persistent. You know, just just and and sticking to the to the plan. That was a big thing as well. Like, don't look for short term win gains and like that. You know, think long term. Um, and Sorry, the kids are uh, shouting oh, their heads off here. Don't worry about it. I have the same on this side. <laughs> it's like backing music. Sorry. It's grand. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, what was I going to say there? Yeah, so when it when it comes to actually, you know, as a business getting paid, it could take it could take quite a long time. If you think about it, you know, you open you open it, you open the, your doors, you get your clients on boarded. Say that takes a month, some clients, um, and then you get the jobs in, and then you. You have to have your candidates, so you're you're speaking with them, find out what they want, and then you know they're they're doing a few interviews, which could take you know yourself, they could take three weeks, you know, yeah. four weeks, and then they get an offer, then they take a week to accept, and then uh, and this is just obviously your 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 first 
time getting paid, you know, with one person. And then they have a notice period of, of two months, you know, and then, then you have your, your, your terms, which would be your, you know, your, your days uh, to get paid. Um, that could be, you know, say 30 days. Um, you know, they're all of a sudden you're six months down the line and, you know, you haven't made a cent. So yeah, yeah. thinking about that was important. Um, but we under, we, it's thinking that through properly and understanding that. So some people might have been like, if you don't think that through properly, you might think, oh yeah, you'll get paid, you know, in two months or whatever. So it's having enough runway to withstand that. Uh, but we did a few things that we probably shouldn't have done. We, we looked, we were doing a bit in Canada, you know, um, we were doing a bit international stuff where we, we should have just been looking in front of ourselves on, on our, on our own doorstep. Um, like there's plenty of clients there, but we were just thinking, almost thinking too big at the start. Um, but my advice to anyone would be nail your, your current market first yeah. before you start going global. You know, that was just silly, but you, you learn these things as you go along, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a fascinating experience and, and you had a young family at the time as well. So it must have been quite a, a stress, a stressful time as well, especially as you said, when you turn the lights on and not, not, not the phones aren't ringing and, and no one's banging your door down. But you also, I guess you had the art as well, which is another good reason. I guess that was always going in parallel for you. So you always had kind of that, that outlet as well, I, I assume, which, which is yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. It was look. it's the thing is with, with risk and reward, like they are direct they are directly aligned. I have found like anything that I haven't taken a risk on hasn't given me much reward. Put it that way. Like, mm -hmm. so it's like, if you want to achieve something big, which we have, and we're, we're doing really well, but it, it took a lot of risk to, to get something big. And there's just no way around that. Um, hold on one sec. Sorry. Hold on. <laughs> no worries at all. Sorry, I'm back. Oh, you, you shouldn't have <laughs> muted it. A good old shout would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the curse on these podcasts, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's a good segue into your own podcast, uh, Shark Pod. And I've, mm. it's a brilliant podcast and you, you talk to entrepreneurs um, as part of it. How did that come about? How has your own experience of, of starting that been? And, you know, wh what drove you to do it? Um, probably similar reasons to yourself with the the career thing obviously you know the career guidance thing is and, and just the interest in people's careers and how different paths people take that's that's always been there and that's and that's why i started darwin hawkins is is to help people in their career there's not more than someone in the wrong job and you know like so so you're really changing people's helping change people's yeah. lives you know um in that respect so a big interest in in careers in business entrepreneurship so so i do it with my um my brother-in-law, Luke Curry. So Luke works in sales in HubSpot, um, a big, big tech firm in, in Dublin. Um, so I know Luke since, since I was 17 and he was 12, put it that way. So nice. I, I'm, I'm married to Luke's sister. Obviously we're, we're together since we were 17. So we late into the night, many nights, all we'd be talking about is, is business and entrepreneurship. And like, he'd be, he's big into the kind of Tony Robbins stuff. And, oh, yeah. uh, all, all all that kind of stuff. So we just have a real interest in it. I'm really interested and inspired by others, you know. Um, so we said, look, we should record these conversations uh, and get people, get interesting people on in, in areas that we're interested in. So say if we're interested in Bitcoin yeah. and we're just very inquisitive people, you know, you can look online and stuff like that. But like, if you want to know, really know about crypto and Bitcoin, you get, try get the, like the expert in it and get a chat with them. Now, who's going to want to chat to you? Just uh, some random stranger that says, asks you questions. You're not going to get that. No. But if you have a podcast, you'd be amazed at who will agree to come on because people love talking about what they're passionate about. Yeah. Like what I'm doing now. Like I, I, I enjoy doing this. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fun to do. So it was getting access to actually really interesting people doing really interesting things, particularly in Ireland. Um, so we've had some amazing guests on. Uh, I don't know if you know Norman Crowley. Um, he's like a Crowley Carbon. He it's kind of like a, an Irish Elon Musk. Is is what is what I'm he's like. Look, I'm just looking up. What's yeah. his name? And Niall Crowley is it? Norman. Norman Crowley. Crowley. Yeah. yeah. So he basically puts like old like Ferraris and stuff and like makes them electric. And um, that's part of what they do. But he has a business that saves uh, like skyscrapers on their energy. Um, so when they're doing too much consumption, 
it turns it off and stuff like that. And he, oh. he they get to cut it off. But he's a very famous entrepreneur, but one of the biggest in, in Ireland. Um, we've had him on for a chat. Just really, like he sold a business for like 500 million before. Um, just that, amazing achievement. <laughs> oh, is that all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, and like we've had, who else have we had on? Like the, the guys from the Happy Pair. We had uh, just lo local businesses. I listened to that one. That was yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some energy he has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Superb. Um, and even on the Bitcoin thing, there was a Bitcoin guy. We like we, he has like uh, Peter McCormick. His name. His name is. He's like a, a British guy, but he essentially advised. I think it's, it's uh, El Salvador or somewhere like that. Um, or what was the there's a one, there's a country actually that used Bitcoin as their national currency now in South America. I can't remember the the who it is exactly, but he advised them on how to go about doing that. Do you know what I mean? He's like yeah. two hundred thousand Twitter followers, so he came on to chat for us for an hour about Bitcoin. You know, and I still haven't, I still haven't delved into it. But um, but if you if I want to do something, I I really want to know about it first. So that's why essentially we 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 did the podcast, and we haven't missed. We I think we've missed maybe two weeks in the last two years so we've 99 episodes i think in and again it's yeah. it's it, it's not a chore like it's so easy just to talk to someone for an hour you know yeah exactly exactly and you have you have a web it's sharkpod.ie is it uh, the website for the podcast uh, i think it's shark.ie yeah oh, shark uh, just on we're on spotify and stuff like that um it's it's nice and that there's no pressure for me to to do it it's like it's the only thing i don't make money out of you know yeah. and it's kind of nice that way and i kind of want to keep it that way um so there's no pressure um yeah. so yeah yeah it's just inquisitiveness it's similar to why i'm doing this really it's just a game mm. like it's kind of satisfying your own personal kind of passion to do something and bring something to others and learning at the same time i i think it's great really um yeah. so mark i ask everybody this towards the end of the podcast and it's kind of if you if you look back on your career and i i think you know we we could have probably five separate podcasts on your career and, and delve into each one in, in more detail. And maybe you'll come back on again in the future. We can focus maybe just on the art or just on, on the podcast or whatever. But if you could meet yourself back when you were 17, 18 again, is there any, like what advice would you give yourself? Is there anything you'd do differently? Um, um, that's a good question. What would I do differently? I would, I would learn how to sell. And that's what I do. I'd, I'd learn how to sell. You're always selling in life, um, in all aspects. So, I would probably do, probably do some sort of course on on how to sell. You know, and how to. You'll never go hungry if you, if you can sell. Put it that yeah. way. So yeah. that'd be something that springs to mind straight away. Um, and it would be. That's a tough one. Advice. Would you become like an I'm? I'm. The thing is, I'm. I'm actually. Huh? Would you have become an entrepreneur earlier? Would you have focused on trying to start a business earlier, or do you think you needed to go through? The very That's the thing. Yeah. To get to yeah. Be able I don't. Do I think everything that I've done is actually leads in quite well to what I'm doing now, and I'm very, very happy with what I'm doing now. Like I've, I've, I'm at the point now where I'm literally living the dream that I that I wanted, but everything I did. I wouldn't, our business in Darwin Hawkins wouldn't be as good as it is if if I wasn't a qualified accountant. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If we yeah. were all qualified accountants, um, most of us. So that kind of fits in there. So I probably would go and become an accountant again if, if, if I was, you know. Um, so I would say I'd, I'd just tell myself like some, some of the skills, you know, would be learning to, learning to sell for sure, being resilient. You have to be resilient if you can learn to be resilient that kind of comes along with the selling if you're some people some of the best entrepreneurs i've met are door, did door-to-door -door sales you know when they were and they were younger you know really? and that builds up such resilience and character and you learn so much from that now i i've never done it um and also i'd say if you don't take risk you won't get the reward that you're looking for that is something i've learned that is almost like a scientific fact to me if you don't take if you take they're de directly correlated, risk and reward, in my opinion, unless you win the lotto or something like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's great, great advice. And listen, Mark, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming on. And as I said, thank you for supporting me when I first started this and reaching out to 
offer offer help if I I needed it. And I wish you yeah, no continued problem. success in all the things that that you do. Um, it's it's you're, you're hugely impressive, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Emil. Look, and it's, look, I listened to the other podcast. I think it's really great what you're doing. So uh, looking forward to listening to the. I'll skip my one, but uh, to the ones <laughs> after that. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Emil. Bye bye. Cheers.